Good evening, and welcome to Praise of Folly. I'm your host for this evening, Keith Preston. Um, with me t this evening are uh, Todd Lewis, who is uh, the regular host of the program, and also two very special guests, um, Andy Nowicki and Colin Liddell from Alternative Right and a, a number of other uh, places where they publish their work or do podcasting. So welcome to the program, everyone. Yep, happy Good to be, be here. here. Hey, hey uh, uh, so uh, thanks for having me on. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about this evening is the alternative right, and we're going to be uh, looking at the alternative right from uh, somewhat of a critical perspective in the sense of, well, what is the alternative right and where is it going, and would perhaps some criticisms of the alternative right and what defenses can be made um, in the of the alternative rights and I know Todd has some questions that he'd like to ask so Todd why don't you just uh, start firing away with some questions sure sure um, to, to avoid confusion I'm gonna start off with the definition of the alternative right that Ramsey Paul gave on the Ameren conference on the video that you guys put up on your alternative right I think that blogspot website and I think that's a pretty generic and acceptable definition um, well, one of what, what sort of one of the points that I find is somewhat uh, problematic is uh, the I, I keep on forgetting his name. Who's that Croatian guy from the alt right? Uh, Tom Suvic. Su Sunic, thank you, Tomislav Sunic. He, uh, yes. yeah. he um he mentioned once in a I used to listen to the Voice of Reason back when it was a actual radio show. <laughs> it was like four years ago now. He uh, that's where I first heard about you, Keith Preston, by the way. He, uh, well, Tom's program was the first podcast I was ever on, actually. Hmm. Well, so Tom Slunick said that uh, he, re he, he represented a kind of pagan Europe. But by pagan Europe, he meant something like, you know, the, the, the intellectuals of ancient classical Greece and Rome, like Aristotle and <clears throat> uh, Cicero, and, you know, a more sort of intellectualized and respectable paganism. And, um, I, I, I think to myself, like C.S. Lewis did in his uh, screw tape letters, if only that were true. I, I feel like that while the alternative right has a kind of a fascination and a kind of a pagan uh, aesthetic, if you will, it's, it, yeah. it, 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 in the sense that Sunik meant, talks about pagan, they're not really pagan. Uh, classical Greek philosophy had, of course, many different schools of thought, but uh, many, the, the the big I guess you could say the big four Stoicism, Epicureanism, Aristotelianism, and Platonism uh, all represented a kind of moderation. The human will triumphing over the animal passions. Right, there's the Platonic tripart soul, tripartite soul of reason, uh, you know, passion, and uh, will. Right, so right, you have the uh, the rational soul that governs the body, and then you have this kind of uh, spirited, almost like the soldier. So right in Plato's Republic, you have the philosopher kings who are the rational, the democracy, which is the spirited element, and the appetitive element is the oligarchy and democracy. And in many ways, mod the modern-day alt-right seems to be dominated by a kind of uh, pleonexia, which was in, in Greek philosophy was kind of an unrestrained hedonism. And if you read like the Platonic yeah, dialogues, Milo, I think by now here. Yeah. What? You seem to be referring to to Milo Yiannopoulos. Well, not necessarily Milo, but there there does they 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 claim that they're pagan in the intellectualized sense of the big four, but they're not, and and it's like it's. I think that's a problem well, yeah, because totally the big when you say like, they, you know, when you're talking about the alt right, you say they. And then that immediately kind of uh, presupposes that they're a, a, a very uh, unified group that agree with every, uh, with each other. So, you know. no, you're right. You're right. They don't. There, there's it's, the alternative right is a very I mean, wide that's what, and that's what gives it its, its pagan character. Really, it's this. Uh, it's very polymorphous. It it has many uh, manifestations. It's not um, unified in a very uh, Judaic centralized way. Well, okay. Well, let me let me. Maybe rephrase the the objection a little bit. Um, classical pagan philosophy, at least in the big four that I mentioned, is is the idea that there's this 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 the the Greek nous, the reason 
of the will. That's the, the highest level of the tripartite soul. And the kind of uh, there was a hedonistic philosophy. It was called hedonism, and to some extent also the cynics were hedonistic. But um, they're they're pagan only in this in this one sense. I mean, you you don't see a lot of Neoplatonists or Aristotelians or Stoics walking around in the alt right. At least I haven't seen them. Maybe I haven't seen enough of the alt right to know to, to see them at all. But it does seem that the alt right that is pagan isn't pagan in the sense of the sophisticated sense that Sunik uh, talks about. Even Sunik himself is kind of a uh, pleasure-seeking play in which yeah, well, There's a kind of distinction, I think, that needs to be maybe emphasized between uh, the, the alt-right and uh, the neo-reaction neo movement. Uh, I think the neo-reaction movement was kind of very ostensibly uh, intellectualized. And uh, they did bring in a lot of philosophy, and those are the people that, that uh, you know uh, used to read uh, the books about Evola and Nietzsche and Heidegger, and they, they wanted to, to to bring all that in, both to sort of signal their um, kind of intellectual quality, but uh, you know, so they had, they had various motivations to do that. Uh, one, one on one level, it was a kind of uh, sincere attempt to uh, try to tackle deep philosophical issues. On, on another level, it was an attempt to signal um, intellectual worthiness, uh, which kind of suggests a, a something like an com uh, inferiority complex against the prevalent hegemonic uh, belief system. Um, uh, Andy, do you have any comments on on this? Yeah, well, I was wondering. <clears throat> I was curious to know more about your your observation. Um, that that the alt right is primarily hedonistic. Where what um, can you give some examples of this and and uh, what what and, and tell how these examples constitute uh, a, a general philosophy or mindset uh, that emphasizes pleasure seeking? Uh, sure, sure. Um, uh, there's two levels, right? There's the kind of crass, vulgar level of the comment section which maybe we could just say is beyond the pale and we could ignore that. But to some extent, that is a, a measure of the rank and file. But, but let's stick to a more sophisticated level, someone like Tomislav Sunik, someone like Greg Johnson or Richard Spencer or uh, Jack Donovan. Um, in, in a lot of ways, if you read Countercurrents, I, I've, I've followed the... I, I, I discovered the alternative right probably when... Uh, you and, well, when Andy and Colin and uh, Spencer all created the original Alternative Right website around 2011. Um, and that's when I first discovered what the Alternative Right was. Um, and then from there I discovered, you know, uh, as short-lived as it was, uh, The Voice of Reason and, and then Radix Journal and Countercurrents and other groups. But there's this kind of, uh, for instance, Cynic himself, I think, is an example of a kind of hedonist, right? You... I remember this one uh, speech he gave talking about the, the Greek gods. And, you know, even the Platonists were kind of uh, embarrassed at a very literal interpretation of the Iliad. They kind of thought, well, that's going to be kind of allegorical. That's so sensual and humanistic, it's kind of beneath us. So when, when, when Sunik is telling me that he wants to be a sophisticated pagan, like a Platonist or a Stoic or an Epicurean or a Ciceroian, but then he at the same time appeals to a kind of crass, sensual paganism that we see in, like, cinema, I'm like, eh, it's like cross messages here, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, um, I, I, uh, I don't know Sunich's thought all that well, I'll admit. Um, the other people that you've listed off, I mean, I have my differences with, with them, uh, and I, I don't, I think I'm, if I'm if I am in the alt right, I'm a, I'm a very atypical example of the alt right. So uh, that that's probably par for the course for me. But I don't. I mean, that said, I don't know if I if I would define any of the people that you mentioned uh, as primarily hedonistic. I mean, I do think if you want to critique them for being, let's say, godless, I think that would that would work. That would stick. Uh, I don't know if that's your critique or not. Um, um, there are other things you can say about Richard Spencer and Jack Donovan, and I don't know some of the other people that you 
that you mentioned. Hedonistic would not be the term I would use. Uh, uh, now, what you said about the comment section, I, I guess I'd like to, or, or you know, people's posts in in the on the comment pages, uh, uh, that and 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 how they constitute a kind of baseness and vulgarity in many cases, even if they're funny sometimes. Uh, that is one thing that you said that does resonate with me. So I'm interested to know more about that. Like, where where do you read these comments that that <laughs> have this kind of effect on you that that make you think? Uh, oh sure. Lot. Well, well, for me, uh, primarily uh, places like Radix Journal and the Right Stuff Biz. I don't read them much anymore, but uh, yeah. well, let let me rephrase it a little bit. Um, I do have multiple levels of critique, but I want to kind of start on their own terms. Because I think when Sunik said that he's a pagan in the sophisticated sense, I think Sunik was serious. I think he meant to be taken seriously at that level, and I do. But, but what I am saying is if you look at the big four, let me rephrase it a little bit. Hedonism might be too strong of a word. But in, in ancient Greek philosophy, pleonexia was the idea that pleasure was a, was a principle that should be pursued uh, above virtue, or above, or was, actually it was virtuous to pursue pleasure as itself. But uh, whereas you look at Platonism, specifically Platonism, but also Stoicism and Aristotelianism, right. uh, again, classic pagan philosophies of which I have great respect for, even though I, you know, I'm sure. not, I wouldn't identify as a Platonist or a, per right. se, or an Aristotelian per se, but I have right. respect for those traditions. Uh, they would all agree that pleasure itself, I mean, Aristotle said, uh, the wise man does not seek to avoid uh, does not seek to maximize pleasure, but he seeks to avoid pain. Uh, and, you know, Platonists, uh, the, the Neoplatonists themselves were actually borderline ascetic. They were almost Buddhists in their uh, self-abnegation from the world uh, when it came to uh, uh, the pleasure of the bed or the table or the, or the wine bottle. Um, and uh, really, the, the alternative right, at least as I see with the comment sections, but also even with the more sophisticated leadership uh, doesn't really take that line. that They claim their peg is in the sophisticated sense. And I just, I don't see that. I don't see a kind of sophisticated neoplatonic, you know, or, or Aristotelian uh, rejection of, of physical delights. Um, I, I almost wish they were actually a sophisticated pagan. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're correct in, in uh, saying that, that, uh, the, these people that these writers, the, these uh, uh, I don't know, columnists, thinkers, speakers, what have you, uh, that they aren't Neoplatonists and they aren't uh, Aristotelians and and so forth. Um, I still I don't know if I would I, I don't want to get too hung up on definitions here. You know I don't want to go uh, uh, back and forth in some kind of tiresome way. Uh, you know defining terms and so forth, but I don't. I don't think the emphasis would be on hedonism, although you know I I, I do think that maybe something uh, I think there's a uh, you know in what I would consider an improper ordering of values or uh, just again from my perspective uh, in a lot of this a lot of this thinking uh, uh, that that we're talking about here, um, but I'm. I'm curious to know more about your, you know, your, your critique and the, and the various levels of it. I know you've started out with on this, on this uh, subject of saying you wish that they were, you know, they, they they present themselves as pagans. And I think when they when they present themselves as pagans, my impression isn't that they are. And maybe Colin can fill us in here because I think Colin is a self-professed pagan himself. Uh, I do I don't think that means the uh, uh, Aristotelian or, or ancient Greek or Platonic sense of of paganism, like the high uh, the high paganism of of the uh, you know the Hellenistic age. I don't think that's what they're uh, um, uh, what co what their what constitutes their general philosophy. No, so. I, I would say you're right, but I would say that Sunik though does directly appeal to the high paganism. The paganism of the New Right tends to be more Germanic or Norse. Mm -hmm. And that might be uh, a segue to another critique, is a kind of um, maybe anti-intellectualism. Uh, I've heard Greg Johnson say 
directly that even Hellenism itself is an anti-white universalistic doctrine, much like Christianity. And they well, if you're not Christian, you're not Hellenist, uh, I'm hard-pressed to figure out how you're European at all, because from, I don't know, you know, the, 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 the end of the Greek Dark Ages in 750 B.C., up until the age of Constantine, for about a thousand years, Hellenism was the dominant position in the West. And then from Constantine until the, until the French Revolution, Christianity was the dominant position. But he's also not a liberal. So he rejects the three main strands of European history. And I'm like, well, how are you European if you reject Hellenism, Christianity, and liberalism? To me, that seems like it's almost anti-European. Well, well Greg, Colin, I think said. Greg specifically identifies as a national socialist, doesn't he? I mean, doesn't Greg claim to be actually be a national socialist? So I think that I'm not sure he does. Actually, I, I'm pretty sure he does. Um, he, uh, I, I, I reviewed one of his books once. I think he's pretty much in that vein of thought. So it makes sense he would appeal to Germanic paganism over these other things. Well, yeah, Greg. Greg, Greg strikes me as mainly a liberal, uh, but with. Um, white nationalism added to cover up the inevitable defects of liberalism. <laughs> That's probably true. Um, How do you mean that, Colin? Can you can you elaborate? Um, yeah, most of his positions do seem to be quite... Uh, he's, he's, he's very much a, a swipple, uh, you know, in cultural terms and um, the way he comes across uh, but there is this one hard uh, nationalistic edge to him, and, and I think uh, that might seem like a contradiction to most people. But in a in a way, it makes perfect sense because liberalism has very very fatal flaws that need to be addressed. And once you take that uh, that kind of liberalist, uh, uh, materialistic, uh, and of course hedonistic approach to life, which is implicit in liberalism, then uh, you start to actually destroy yourself, and then therefore counterbalance that. And in, in Greg's case, you know, obviously it's white nationalism, and and that's a very interesting uh, kind of synthesis there to go from, I believe. Just as a heads up, I'm getting a lot of interference coming from somewhere. Like like there's a lot of background noise. I'm not sure where that's coming from. I don't know if there's any way to fix that, or if there's uh, any issues it's with the people need to mute uh, their microphones when they're when they're not actually speaking. Yeah, yeah, that's a way to cut back on background noise. When you're not talking, it's probably best to mute your microphone. But uh, well, no, I, listen, well, I have a question. Um, listening to this conversation, perhaps we should start by trying to come up with an actual working definition of what the alt right is. Um, you know, somebody asked me that a while back, and I'm like, well, it's just a wide range of philosophies that reject the left and reject mainstream conservatism, and beyond that, I. I'm a hard have, I'm hard pressed to really put a label on it because it includes everything from uh, white nationalism to race realism to neo eugenicism to the neo reactionary movement to HBD enthusiasts to uh, Catholic traditionalists and neo pagans and uh, and you know Satanists and I've come across all kinds of things in the alt right. It's I don't even know that it. It's all, in many ways, it's not even a movement. It's just sort of a, a mixture of people with all different kinds of ideas that perhaps have this handful of things in common: critiques of mainstream society and, and mainstream conservatism and the left. But so, what? Why don't we try to come up with some kind of working definition of what the alt right is? Well, okay. Let me see if I can come up with some terms that they agree on, and we'll see if Andy and Colin agree with us. I think whatever your position, whatever your personal beliefs are. The alt-right agrees on these positive points. There are objective differences between the sexes. There are objective differences between the races. There are objective differences between individuals. Some are smarter than others. Some are more beautiful than others. Some are stronger than others. These, these objective differences are real. Uh, nature itself is inegalitarian. And um, I actually think I heard Colin say this a couple of times before in other podcasts that if nature's an egalitarian, then it doesn't make sense that we should kind of fight the tide of nature. And these are positive things that I think that all of the alt-right agrees on, whatever their private views are. Would you agree with that assessment, Andy and Colin? Um, yeah, I, I think so. I think that's a, that's a pretty good uh, uh, um, 
the relation of various tenets that I think all the different factions probably hold to. And when you say objective differences between the races and the sexes, um, I, I would I would maybe rephrase that as biological differences sure, between sure. the races and the sexes. Um, but other than that, I think it's it's perfect. I guess by objective I meant real and substantive differences. Yes, that too. So so I, I guess I think that as a if you define a movement purely negatively, you don't get very far. You have to define what the movement's for, what it actually believes. And I, I think I gave a, a a sweep of positive positions that everybody in the movement holds. Uh, do you agree with that too, Colin? Yeah, yeah, it's, um, those those are um, very obvious points. Uh, actually, I think they're the points that almost any human being uh, implicitly acknowledges uh, in in one way or, or another. Uh, so even leftists, uh, even though they might uh, you know be in a state of denial, they they actually live by a lot of those kind of r rules uh, themselves. Um, so that's not really saying too much, I think. That may not be, but but what? I, but I just guess because I think um, I can't think of his name now. The guy that wrote Animal Farm, but he said that telling truth. Well, and it, yeah, Orwell. Orwell. Uh, telling truth in the age of lies is itself a revolutionary action. So, well, it may not be very uh, hard to comprehend. It's kind of revolutionary, though, in an age of lies, right? Yeah, and those are things that people, maybe everybody believes, but people not ever, I mean, nobody admits to believing those those things, or, or hardly anybody does. So. Well, exactly. Think, so that, that's significant. Why, why, why do we... Why do we live in such an age of lies? So that's that's the uh, the question that uh, naturally suggests itself. Well, yeah, that's there's a lot of, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, partly, I think it's because the powers that be have set up a structure system that they drive power from denying those truths. Now that again, we have to ask ourselves, how do those powers that be come to power in the first place? And uh, you pointed this out, actually, Colin, in your um, one of your interviews on uh, Red Ice Radio, specifically with the uh, rise of the Jewish state. While there was an yeah. active intelligence behind it, there was a lot of uh, essentially chance occurrences, right? I mean, Turkey had to side with Germany. Turkey had to lose a world war. If it didn't happen, you know, the Balfour Declaration wouldn't have happened. And you know that wouldn't have laid the groundwork for Jewish settlement. So there's there's a yeah. lot of yes, a lot of history is is basically ac accidental, and so that uh, undercuts people who believe in these very very elaborate conspiracy theories that uh, are finally worked out in every detail. They're not, you know, things bump along and uh, you know chance occurrences uh, throw things uh, one way or the other. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, let, let me let me preface this subjection in this sense. It, it's not true of all the alt right, as you said. It's a diverse movement, but there are certain elements, and I think you might agree with this criticism. At least I think Andy might. Um, certain elements of the alt right that tend to be what I call racial reductionists. So, for example, let's 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 first talk about reductionism. You have Marxist reductionism, where if you get rid of capitalism and the state and you know the evil patriarchy. You know, we're all going to be this happy, wonderful, communist, stateless society. Well, that didn't really work out that way. It just didn't. And I, th I think a lot of people on the alt-right, they say, if you get rid of the Jews, you get rid of the liberals, you have an all-white society, you can even make communism work. I don't think any society can make communism work, white or not. But I feel there's a kind of reductionism analogous to communism in some quarters of the alternative right, where it's they have these kind of just-so narratives and if we just remove the right people, we'll all be kosher. And to me, it almost has a communist flavor to it, where if we just got rid of the capitalists and the and the, uh, the, the the church and the state, we'd all be good. And I feel like that's it doesn't help the movement. I I'd say that yeah, there's a I would agree that there's an overemphasis on uh, to me anyway, just speaking for myself on racial solidarity and an overemphasis on race in general, um, which isn't to say that race isn't 
isn't important in many ways. And, and today, of course, you're not supposed to believe that race even exists. And to believe that it does exist is to be, you know, to, to, to render yourself uh, a highly suspect individual and, uh, and so forth. And it's a great heresy to believe in, in, in inherent racial differences. Uh, but I, I, I would say, you know, what I would get, what I get from what you just said uh, is, uh, where, where I would agree with you is I think there is an overemphasis on it. It's almost, to me, going to the opposite extreme, um, uh, e equally, equally irrational. Uh, well, maybe not equally. I don't want to draw, a, a, you know, an exact, uh, uh, you know, uh, parallel there necessarily, intellectually speaking. But uh, it, it, it seems irrational as well to say race is everything as it is to say race doesn't exist, race is nothing. Well, exactly, exactly. Um, I, I guess... I'd, uh, I'd, say, I'd like to just cut in and say that uh, I don't really think it is exaggerated. I mean... All right. It's, it is, in a sense, it is slightly retarded to to attribute everything to race. But uh, the fact that a lot of people are very, very concerned about race and even obsess about race is uh, completely understandable in 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 the light of the uh, very, very, you know, dramatic and, and radical demographic changes that are, are are going on. And of course, a lot of people they they kind of see this as as, as part of a, a great conspiracy, and that you know that. That focus on race leads them into other errors, um, but uh, you know that kind of paranoia, if you want to call it that, uh, might actually be very, very logical in the in the end, uh, in the end game. You know what I mean? So, um, some uh, an, an error can sometimes be very productive of beneficial results. And I think we really we really do need to be concerned about being uh, replaced by other cultures. I mean, I, I know it's not um, all due to uh, the Jews, or uh, you know, this or that um, kind of reductionist racial theory, but uh, that that kind of paranoia could actually be quite healthy in a way, in making people much more aware. And uh, you know, one of the things that we we lack is this sense of uh, this sense of unity. We just don't have that in modern Western societies, and we have to kind of find um, a roundabout way of getting that back. So, you know, if you look at uh, all that together, the fact that, uh, you know, white countries are being uh, effectively colonized by third world populations and that uh, whites have been pushed down year after year and their spaces are being taken over, um, to not actually be paranoid is, to, to my mind, very unnatural. I, I, I would say that we have to be careful, though. I mean, I, I, agree, with, I agree with what you've said. I mean, and it's, it is happening across the West and and uh, it is something it is definitely an area of concern and I think what makes it what's worse actually for me worse than the uh, uh, you know the clear attempt at demographic displacement as bad as that is uh, what um, what what bothers me more is that you can't talk about it and uh, you know that somehow mentioning it is 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 a hate crime uh, I mean that 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 troubles me on a much more visceral level than than even the invasion itself. Uh, but but in any case, I would say we have to be careful when we talk about white genocide uh, and whatever other terms that that are often used uh, to describe what's going on. You, I mean, there are white people who are fully in support. Of this trend, and who are, and that the people who are in power in the West are mostly white, and they're they're pushing for this. I mean, and not Jewish either. I mean, you want to the canard to me. I mean, not not it's not a total canard because, you know, uh, it's we should be able to talk about Jewish influence, but there are plenty of non-Jewish whites who are, you know, in charge in power, uh, in one one at one level or another, and they're promoting this. Uh, this uh, displacement, and, and uh, to me, they are the real enemies. They're the ones, uh, the, the elites, the ones who are in charge of what's going on right now, uh, uh, in charge of marshalling these trends. You know, I, I think we should 
we should uh, blame them and focus our energy and our anger against them and yeah. not against the, the immigrants per se. Blaming them is quite difficult because really they're just uh, agents of certain economic forces as well. And, uh, you know, this sort of materialistic outlook of the entire West. So, you know, blaming anybody is almost a bit pointless. But, uh, you know, what, what needs to happen, there needs, there needs to be a kind of um, collective emotional reaction against things. And trying to run everything on a very kind of cerebral and rational basis is, is not how things happen in uh, the history of the world. So, you know, uh, just you know, let all the, the poisons hatch out of the mud uh, as they will. Well, let me, let me maybe explain something real quick. Um, by racial reduction, is, let me give a concrete example. I think there's been a small misunderstanding here. Um, uh, for example, if you look at, say, the likes of, say, Countercurrents or Radix Journal or even, you know, the right stuff, Viz, they talk about European civilization and they talk about white civilization. And they say that, you know, white civilization did X, Y, and Z and isn't that wonderful. Um, and at the same time, though, there's this kind of, like, anti-Christian element to it. So it's like, well, okay, so you kind of reject the last 2,000 years of our history but still accepted at the same time. But, but here's a concrete example. In the year 0 AD, China and Rome were roughly equally developed in culture, science, technology, architecture, civilization, and every possible matrix. China might have been slightly a little bit more developed than Rome. Um, and in fact, until what historians and sociologists call the Great Diversions, which occurred around 1500, Europe... Uh, it, except during the Roman era, it was not much to brag about, actually, uh, compared to the Near East and India and China and even Mesoamerica. Until 50, around 1500, uh, Europe could reach parity with, like, say, the Romans, uh, but generally uh, was not even as high as China or India. Now, the, the, if, if there's this inerrant whiteness, that this is the racial reductionism that makes Europe great, and, you know, according to the alternative right, you know, we, I don't know, the white race has been around for, I don't know, 20,000, 30,000 years. Why did it take, what was the last 500 years that the white race embodied all of these superlative qualities? When, for most of that time, it was no better off than the Chinese or the Indians or the Egyptians. Um, I, I feel like the problem here is that when you look at the Great Divergence, they don't have an answer. The answer for the Great Divergence is less racial and, and, and more of a cultural, religious aspect. As a Christian, um, I, I would tend to explain the Great Divergence as a result of the influences of Christianity. Uh, the reason why it didn't happen sooner was in part due to barbarian invasions that kept on yeah, keeping but if you Europe... Say that, if you say that, but, then you have to explain how Christianity uh, led to that uh, higher level of uh, technology and uh, achievement. Well, sure, sure. I mean, I can do that, but just... For the sake of argument, though, let's just look at, look at the race issue. The race issue alone cannot explain the great divergence. And that's where I find this uh, racial reductionism problematic. That's a separate question from how Christianity did it, which I can answer. But I would just like to kind of get your first response to the racial reductionism and its inability to answer the problem of the great divergence. Well, I think, uh, I think you actually could um, explain the, the Great Divergence by uh, re reference to racial differences. And, uh, I mean, the way, the way to do that, you could say that the, the, um, the aspects of uh, white people's nature that uh, led to their achievements also held them back earlier on. And so if you, th if you think about, uh, you know, what, what are the, the main differences now? Um, East Asian people, they, um, you know, they're they're slightly, they have slightly higher IQ, so they say. Um, with uh, Western people, there's more of a spread of IQ, so we have uh, more stupid people and more very intelligent people. Uh, Western West uh, white people tend to be more aggressive, you know. So there's there's various things you could you could sort of zoom in on, and you could say like, okay, those those characteristics could um, they could have promoted uh, internecine warfare uh, that, that could have held a society back. But um, under, under different circumstances, when things had stabilized, those factors then pushed the white race forward. 
And you can also see that in terms of uh, the, the, the kind of political organization. China always consolidated it into a large centralized state covering uh, almost the entire area of their civilization. Whereas uh, white people, we tended to uh, be divided into separate uh, competing states. And you can see how that would uh, help to drive quality. Well, I. I think that's a good argument, but I think that is more of a cultural argument than a racial argument. Um, because the Roman Empire was this large, homogenous state like China, and it, and it was the production of European civilization. In fact, yeah, it was an even, 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 even Aristotle himself believed that the universal state was the kind of end goal. And that's what, Alexander tried to actually create the universal empire that Aristotle envisioned, but he failed. It was the Romans that actually succeeded in creating this universal. It's almost like a, it's almost like a universal human dream. Whether you're in China, India, Europe, the Middle East, or Mexico, this universal human kingdom is a kind of a dream that all men have. Um, some men are better at achieving it than others. It wasn't much of a dream for my ancestors. Uh, you know, on the the north side of Hadrian's Wall. Well. That's true, and it wasn't much of a dream for the people on the north side of the Chinese wall either. But, uh, but I guess within each ethnic group, the the Asiatics, the whites, the Arabs, the, the in American Indians, there's an element that represents that universalistic dream. Um, it's Andy, more what more are some of your uh, power? Isn't it? It's more about the nature of power. Power always wants to uh, expand itself, and and we see that today really with uh, this kind of globalist Western uh, kind of anti-racial empire. Yeah, yeah, but Andy, Andy, I kind of want to get some of your insights on this. Mm -hmm. What do you think about these uh, thoughts or things you have to say about what we just talked about? Well, the, uh, with regard to the Great Divergence, I mean, I, what you call the, what you're calling the Great Divergence, um, you know, I would, I would ask things because I'm a, I'm a, uh, artsy uh, liter literary kind of guy I guess if I'm you know if I were to describe myself and when you talk about what happened 500 years ago in the West the, the first thing I think of is Shakespeare um, yeah and maybe that's taking things in a different direction than what you're talking about you're talking about technological advancements that have happened in the last 500 years in, in the West as opposed to other places uh, in the world I would ask, is what is it about? What is it? You know, are there other? Yeah, I mean, there, are, there are great. There's great literature in in China and in Japan and other places. But is there an equivalent to a figure like Shakespeare or somebody like Dante, uh, uh, or, or others? Uh, these kinds of giants of the West. Uh, do, is is there any equivalent to that in 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 any other? culture that, I mean, when I say equivalent, I don't just mean somebody else, another writer who's who's renowned, but somebody else with that same kind of insight, I mean, and that same kind of uh, uh, vision. Uh, and and I would argue that's part of what makes the West unique, uh, is that it, it has been able to produce uh, art of that kind, which isn't, to, again, it's not to say that that uh, there isn't you know art, great art, uh, to be found all across the world. But I think there's something unique in the West. Uh, and so, that, Andy, would you say that's uh, a kind of racial characteristic? Well, it could be. It, it's. I mean, it, it's. Uh, that's a that's a good question. I mean, is it is it is it a racial characteristic? Ex I, I don't think it's a racial characteristic exclusively because there are. Westernized. There, there are people in the West uh, uh, who who are who, who live in the West now, who uh, are from whose origin is elsewhere, but they are just as Western in their, you know, perspective and uh, you know uh, and and way of looking at things and and you know uh, as as any native Westerner, as anyone whose whose roots are in the West, uh, and they seem to be. Able to some of them seem to be able to glom on to uh, what's uh, what's significant, uh, uh, you know, about 
Western art or, or Western culture. Um, so I would say it's not exclusively, it can't exclusively be racial, but there, I, you know, maybe there is something in uh, the composition of, let's say, the white man, for lack of a better word, uh, with regard to um, uh, notions of individuality, individualism, um, and I'm not necessarily promoting individualism, you know, I'm not promoting radical individualism, but I think that, the, something that maybe there's something in the West that values that uh, uh, perspective there, in a way that really isn't seen elsewhere in the world, and that's both yeah, I you know I've I think that uh, I, I it might have been Jared Taylor who made this observation, but I remember whoever made it, I I kind of filtered it through my own uh, perspective, and it, it came to me that the West is the only place uh, that um, where liberalism actually exists, and when we talk about liberalism, you know, I mean. Both good, what, what could be called good liberalism and bad liberalism, um, and so only the West could create uh, this this uh, the kind of uh, societies that we have where there is such concern for freedom or, or for uh, you know individual dignity and and humanity and humane treatment and and all this kind this kind of stuff. But on the other hand, only the West could. Uh, you know, in a in we could say a degenerate state uh, could have created this the the culture we have now, where there seems to be this suicidal trend to this this trend to this this um, uh, inclination to almost want to uh, sacrifice your own birthright uh, because it, it, because it just wouldn't be nice to exclude foreigners. Um, so yeah, yeah, you brought up a lot of interesting points, Andy. Well, and here's a question. I if I may interrupt, uh, here's a question sure. I'd like to ask Andy. I, I know that um, Todd and Andy both come at some of these questions from a, a Christian perspective, although Andy, is, I know, is Catholic and, and um, Todd is, is Protestant. Uh, but Andy, how do, how do you see Christianity as playing a role in this? Because I know for Todd, Todd's outlook is very Christian-centric. I mean, it's, uh, it's he considers Christianity to really be the fundamental building block of Western civilization, if I understand his views correctly. And and how would you fit Christianity into this, Andy? Well, um, clearly, I, I, I mean, I would say that in, in uh, the, the and I'm no historian, I don't want to talk above my pay grade here, but just because I'm being asked this question, um, I mean, uh, Todd was talking earlier about pagan uh, Greece uh, in the high paganism of the, he the Hellenic age, uh, and you know clearly there there was before Christianity there was a there was already something like you know something like this impulse was there um, you know in in the Western world now a lot of the, these ancient cultures in the you know ancient Greece and ancient Rome were, were, they had a lot of aspects that we would consider barbaric, and uh, we would definitely see certain things about them as objectionable, but there was a, in, in a what we, could, we could say, an enlightened uh, element to these cultures, you know, pre-Christian, um, that, that, that's already there, that maybe argues that there's something more if not racial, then cultural, and where does the culture, you know, if that, where does that cultural inf influence come from? Well, that's a, that's the question. Now, with the advent of Christianity, uh, I would say that you know there's definitely, uh, you know, more concern with individual souls. Uh, you know, uh, the, it, it's only after Christianity that abortion becomes thought of as as an abomination, and you know the, uh, the the whole uh, development of of um, of the the uh, uh, rules of per, you know just war theory, whereby you know it's it's there there are formulations made that you can't just go and wipe out another country and kill all the women and children and and so forth, which isn't to say it didn't happen, you know, frequently, but there was the point is there was there was the development of this doctrine. 
that emphasize the importance of individual lives and of sparing civilian lives as you know and making a distinction between civilian lives and and you know the the lives of people who are actually fighting the war you know uh, protecting yourself fighting for, you know um, uh, the notion of self defense uh, as opposed to indiscriminate killing and it's okay because uh, you know uh, he who has the gold makes the rules you know that that whole notion I mean I, a lot of these what I'm saying is a lot of these ideas came along because of Christianity and but they were there in some uh, uh, in some way prior to Christianity as well so that would be my answer I would say you know a, a little bit yes a little bit no <laughs> um, there's a couple of things here Andy about the great divergence in some sense, it is technological, but as far as culture, you asked about Shakespeare. Is there? Well, I would also say that Shakespeare is deeply Christian in many ways, and um, that makes him unique, because uh, if you look at say ancient Greek and Roman uh, literature, which is it's good stuff. I mean, I'm not I'm not gonna knock it, but if you look at, like the Greek tragedies and the Roman philosophy, you know, the Greek and Roman philosophical works, uh, the tragedies, the plays. The level of sophistication, I mean, if you so you read that stuff, and then you read like the Epic of Gilgamesh and the, the Thousand and One Nights, you know, from the uh, Islamic tradition, or if you read, uh, say, you know, the Chinese, the the what was it, the Three Romances, the Romance of the Three Kingdoms. I never read it, but I heard it's one of the great classics of Chinese literature. Um, you know, and if you read uh, the Epic of the Kings, uh, medieval. Islamic translation of Zoroastrian Persian mythology. Uh, that stuff is just as riveting as anything I read in the Iliad. I've read segments of the Epics of the Kings, uh, where Rostran, the great hero, is fighting off his villains, and there's all these great human tragedies that we find in the Iliad. Um, I find there's a kind of perennialism amongst pagan cultures, China, India, Europe, the Middle East. There's this kind of perennial equality. That the best of China, the Middle East, India, Europe is roughly equivalent. But when you get to the Christian age, there's this level of complexity, introspection. That Well, as a historical fact, uh, Augustine invented the idea of the self. I mean, his, his autobiography, The Confessions, is the first autobiography in history. And that's, of course, due to his Christian values. The idea of the self, the individual that introspects. There might have been Greek uh, shadows or premonitions with like Plato, because I mean, there's Augustine himself was in substance influenced by Platonism. He was a Manichaean in his youth, which was a kind of Platonic Jewish philosophical hybrid. But uh, you you don't see the idea of the individual self until Christianity. That's the invention of Christianity, and that's just a historical fact. The other thing you don't see until Christianity is the advent of the scientific method, which is invented actually in the Middle Ages by the French, or not French, the Catholic English uh, philosopher, metaphysician, I think it was Roger Bacon. And he actually had a stipend from the Pope to do scientific research. And um, so we don't see anywhere else in the world until Christendom this flowering of science and culture, this level of complexity, this level of depth, which makes me question the racial reductionism. Because if I read Roman literature and, and I read about Roman science, it's no more or no less sophisticated than Chinese literature. In fact, Chinese science is probably slightly more advanced. The Chinese invented gunpowder before the West. The Chinese had you know, advanced mechanical machines before the West. Um... So, on a purely perennial pagan level, I see them as all, the best of them are roughly equivalent. But yeah, I think... Like to, uh, I'd just like to cut in here and say that, of course, uh, we can't really um, speak with absolute authority about uh, the pagan civilization that predated Christianity because uh, the Christians who, who took over took uh, special pains to expurgate large uh, uh, parts of that culture. And then uh, regarding uh, Shakespeare, of course, uh, 
I think some some uh, reference should be made to, to the fact that about half half of his plots and uh, plays were based upon uh, the work of uh, Plutarch. As far as Shakespeare, you're correct. Uh, Coriolanus and Julius Caesar were both lifted straight out of Plutarch. Um, but I, I would argue there's a kind of level of Christian introspection that we find in Shakespeare, and not just Shakespeare, but his entire generation, that uh, is is, uni is unique to that post-pagan world. Um, and as far as... Uh, well, there yeah, were actually, a lot of that has to do with the fact that uh, Christianity um, existed as a, as a, as a specific uh, class in contradistinction to the kind of um, the more typical ruling elites who uh, who historically have always been uh, more military based, and so with the the rise of the Catholic Church, you had a you had something which was completely new in that respect, um, and so that was much more introspective. It was much more um, it created certain values, not out of uh, a love of those values it, uh, themselves, but um, has a way to kind of compete with the uh, the other elites, which would be the military and the feudal and the uh, kind of aristocratic elites. Uh, actually, uh, Colin, you said something that I want to kind of launch off of as another critique. Um, you mentioned the relationship to the to the Christian world and the pagan world, and and this gets in another critique that I have of many elements, but not all elements of the alternative right. Uh, they're a kind of glorified fedora tipper. Um, we have this narrative, uh, a classic example of this would be uh, Carl Sagan's Cosmos. He has a, uh, an episode of Cosmos that deals with uh, the Library of Alexandria. It's all very, you know, melodramatic and, you know, this, 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 this glorious pagan past and Christianity buried it in the dust. Um, but it, but it, modern, scholarship, uh, sec modern scholarship, secular and otherwise, has, has largely debunked this... Um, uh, Humean, uh, Gibbon myth. Uh, in fact, uh, cl classical philosophy, classical uh, thought was was highly valued by medieval Christendom. Um, Jerome, the fourth century church father, uh, was actually very guilty of his love of classical texts. The Irish monks, in fact, most of our classical texts that we have now are preserved by Irish monks in the Dark Ages uh, due to in spite of the raids of Vikings and, and Saxons and other uh, deleterious uh, movements, which we wouldn't have otherwise. And then also, the rest of the texts that we have are the result of the Greek Christians in the Eastern Empire, which recorded all those texts and then later fled from the Turkish invaders in the 15th century. Um, and then this who is, who is, kind of... Who is the most, uh, most well-preserved uh, classical author, um, by which I mean uh, which author... Um, do we have the most works by? Probably Plato, but Arist Aristotle and Plato, I would guess, are probably the most preserved. No, no, it's not. It's it's actually Galen, the doctor. Yes, yes. So you know, uh, obviously they found utility in what he wrote. Uh, there was a lot of medical knowledge they could uh, exploit and 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 use to uh, you know bolster the status of the church and so on. Uh, so I think um, what what the Christians preserved off the pagan past was was highly selective, and uh, a lot of it, uh, uh, you know, we just simply don't know what uh, uh, what was uh, destroyed or erased or just neglected into oblivion. Well, actually, uh, actually, at this point here, um, Keith Preston, you might remember a few years ago on your channel, we did discuss this in great detail. Um, most of the pagan works were that were destroyed were destroyed by the invading barbarians um, of the West. Uh, in the East, these works were not forgotten. Uh, That's just a fact. They were not forgotten in the East. Um, though, again, when the Islamic nations invaded the Roman Empire in the East and destroyed it, then you know some loss was incurred, but what was preserved was brought to the West. But there was no loss of Greek classical knowledge in the East, which was a Roman Christian empire. So there's this whole kind of fedora-tipping narrative of Christians destroyed classical knowledge is just uh, bollocks. Uh, in the Eastern Roman Empire, there was no loss of knowledge of uh, classical texts because they, they read the original Greek all the way through the Middle Ages. Even if they had medieval Greek language that they spoke themselves, they could all read Aristotle and Plato, and this is never forgotten for them. For them, it's never forgotten. For the West, it was forgotten because... They... It didn't seem to have much effect because... Uh... 
and the Byzantine Empire was uh, it was moribund for most of its history. It was always on a downward slope, except for a few uh, brief optics. Well, well, again, yeah, that's not entirely fair. Um, modern scholarship in Byzantineology uh, has uh, has demonstrated, for instance, with uh, John Halden, one of the leading modern day scholars in Byzantine studies. The Byzantine Empire was fairly dynamic and evolving until around the Fourth Crusade. The Fourth Crusade was the they had downturns. They had many downturns. They had the Persian Wars, the Islamic invasions under the Arabs after the generation of Muhammad. They had the Turks. They had many setbacks. But after the Fourth Crusade, the Byzantine Empire really kind of fell into a permanent decline. But any scholar of Byzantine history today, this is, again, this is kind of a gibbon myth, a decline and fall of the Roman Empire myth. The, uh, the Eastern Empire was quite vibrant. In fact, in if you were to go anywhere in the world in the 6th or 7th centuries, the leading center of global scholarship was Alexandria, which was a Roman city, which was... Contra Again, this is another problem That's I have with the... Go ahead, sorry. The Greek city, essentially. What? Yeah, Alexandria was a, essentially a Greek city. Well, it was a, culturally Greek, but, but multi-ethnic. But, but what I'm saying is this, though. The leading intellectual center of the world was... Uh, a, in, in the Eastern Roman Empire, and even after uh, um, the conquest of Egypt by the Muslim world, uh, the West only began to par reach parity with the East, uh, i say the 11th century, and then, you know, beyond that, it began to grow exponentially beyond the East. And there, there are reasons for that. Um, but uh, I would say that the, 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 the cla if you hadn't been for the Irish monks in the Eastern Roman Empire, we wouldn't have classical Roman literature or Greek literature. Um, it just wouldn't be there. And this is a general consensus amongst modern scholars that uh, the reason why it was forgotten was when the Roman Empire in the West collapsed to the barbarian invasions, it's the whole civilization broke down. Everything just collapsed. And with repeated barbarian invasions from the East by Asiatic tribes, from the North by Scandinavian tribes, and from the South by Arabs, nobody could rebuild the wreckage until I think, the 11th. Yeah. I think uh, the reason that uh, so much uh, of the, um, the the kind of uh, pagan literature disappeared when uh, the civilization collapsed, it was uh, mainly because it, it, at that point it was no longer actually valued. So pagan civilization had gone into its own decline, and that's why it actually fell. You know, and part of that decline was um, espousing Christianity. That was a kind of symptom of that kind of civilizational decline and collapse. Uh, which happened before the actual physical collapse. And well, one of the reasons for that would probably be the Roman Empire itself, because the Roman Empire was a it was a, a kind of imposition on the organic uh, nature of, of, of peoples. I mean, you had all these uh, organic um, nations that existed before the Roman Empire took them over, and they kind of imposed this totalitarian system on these countries. And, uh, you know, that's what basically uh, laid the groundwork for the collapse of that particular civilization. It didn't uh, sort of respect its, uh, its, its, its inherent um, structure and texture. Well, uh, Andy, Andy, uh, you haven't said much yet. What, what are your thoughts on this kind of uh, discussion about the influence on the West? Is it a cultural or a racial or Christian or whatnot? Well, uh, like I was indicating before... Um, I, I'm tempted to say that there's a combination of uh, explanations. I mean, I think Christianity can explain, a, you know, some of the some of the uh, some of the uh, some of the good that has taken place in the West as far as uh, um, insights into uh, morality and uh, uh, and so forth. But I, I, it seems that there was uh, an element that was there. I'm, I, I don't, I don't want to just repeat what I was saying before. But I'm afraid I don't, I don't know if I have much more to say about it unless you want to, uh, you know. Uh, you well, know, let, uh, let me rephrase the question. Do, you, do, do you see? Do, do you, uh, do you accept or disagree with the proposition that there's a lot of fedora tipping in the alt right based on a kind of gut anti-Christian bigotry that's unjustifiable. 
that's kind of where I was. That's kind of the objection I was developing. Yes, I would agree with that wholeheartedly. Yes, I, I do. I do think that. Now, I mean, I'm I, I'm uh, I'm in favor of a broad uh, a broad church kind of, um, if you will, approach. I don't attack uh, uh, pagans uh, or or atheists uh, who are uh, who are opposed to the same kind of cultural trend, uh, you know, pernicious cultural trends that I am, that uh, that we see taking place right now, uh, uh, culturally speaking. So, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't really uh, engage in, I don't really like to engage in polemics, uh, 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 you know, but it, it, as far as that goes, uh, with with cultural allies. But I do think, yes. Uh, there is uh, there's there's a lot of just I mean there there's a, a reasoned uh, sophisticated kind of uh, uh, take on Christianity that I think is some people are capable of but what I often see and I've complained about this before is just this kind of very crude uh, and uh, unsophisticated not well thought out uh, take on Christianity as being just some, you know, uh, some uh, Jew plot to uh, to make uh, the West uh, be uh, supine to the rest of the world, and for some reason it's just taken two thousand years to to play itself out. And you know, like five hundred years ago, four hundred years ago, three hundred years ago, all these Christian countries in the West were, uh, um, you know, very. Uh, didn't they? They were what we would see today is very ethnocentric, right? They 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 didn't they didn't, uh, they didn't there was no globalist impulse. Uh, you know, Andy, would you say that the, uh, the the Christian hierarchy has been subverted though by certain kind of globalist elements? Yes, that that has clearly happened. Um, I you know I'm tempted to think those are more Freemasonic uh, uh, elements than than Christian, certainly if you're referring to the current Pope or, you know, certain other leaders of the church today, which, you know, I'm certainly not uh, a big fan of, uh, and some of the things that, that are being promoted among Catholicism, but it's not just Catholicism. Uh, but those are more reflections of the times. Those are not anything... My point is, you know, look, if you want to take... If you want to make an informed... Uh, reasoned critique of Christianity, I don't object to that, uh, but just this whole, uh, you know, blaming Christianity for the decline of the West is just absurd. I, I just, I don't, uh, it doesn't make sense to me that, that to blame the essence of Christianity. It's just reductionist. I mean, it's just focusing on one um, aspect or one factor. Here's an issue that I see with the argument that Christianity is the foundation of Western civilization. And I remember um, when I was in college, I was uh, had a class on the history of Africa, and I had this uh, paper I wrote where I was writing about African Christianity, and I uh, so did a lot of research on Christianity in Africa. And what I found is that um, Africa actually has more Christians than any other continent um, in the world, uh, and and they just about every kind of Christian denomination that there is is represented in Africa. And I also saw some data the other day that indicated that fairly soon China may actually have uh, the largest Christian population in the world. And if it, that in fact is true, if, if Christianity is actually more prevalent numerically in Africa than anywhere else, or um, if uh, China now, or if you know the center of Christianity is being transferred to the either to Asia or to the global south or whatever, um, it seems like that it would affect the cultural evolution of those particular places uh, in a, in a fairly significant way. But uh, from what I can tell, it really hasn't done that. Um, it, it doesn't. It doesn't really seem to have had that much of a an impact in terms of its overall uh, impact on cultural evolution. I mean, maybe it's had some impact here and there. But I don't really see that it's dramatically altered the character of any particular nation where it's become prevalent, either in Asia or in Africa or anywhere else. Um, so that leads me to the view that 
in part at least that civil the civilization of the West is something that is um, it, that does predate Christianity in many ways. Now, I, I would see Western civilization as kind of like a set of building blocks. I mean, you, to, to have Western civilization, you can't really do without Christianity. You can't really do without antiquity, and you can't really do without the Enlightenment either. I think that uh, all of those things form the sum total of what Western civilization is today. And I think if you, you know, simply, you know, went back in your time machine and pulled any of those out, you would you would have something that was dramatically different than what, what the West is today. But I, I tend to have a, a more, you know, I guess you could say a multifactorial interpretation of how Western civilization has evolved. I think that geography played a big role in the evolution of Western civilization. The fact that Westerners tended to be seafaring peoples um, to a large degree. I, I think that uh, the fact that we, uh, our Western civilization evolved in a relatively cold climate uh, compared to some other parts of the world impacted the evolution, the social evolution of the West. Um, I, I think that the kinds of political and social structures that existed uh, throughout much of Western history in different places actually played a role in cultural evolution. I think the, the Greek political system played a big role in the formulation of that civilization. And I think the, the medieval, uh, the political structures of the medieval period they sort of laid the foundation for some of the things that came after that. Um, so I don't really think we can reduce it certainly to merely religion or or race either. Um, I think that um, you you have certain racial characteristics of Europeans that you don't find in um, in other parts of the world. But then I, I don't know that 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 there's any one. Character, racial characteristic of Europeans or Westerners that by itself could account for the kinds of cultural evolution we've seen in the West as well either. Um, you know, I think that um, there's a lot of there are a lot of ways, for example, in which Asian people are superior to Westerners, but at the same time, there's a lot of achievements that you've seen in the West that haven't really been replicated very well in in Asia. So it, it seems to me that there's really a multifactorial uh, convergence that's working in all of this. Well, I would agree with many of your points, Keith. Uh, I, I guess maybe I'm trying to paddle on the other side against racial determinism. Maybe I'm overstating the case a bit. Um, but just, I guess, just as far as Asia and Africa goes, uh, your, Europe, to be fair, wasn't transformed overnight either by Christianity. The, uh, the habits of the Greeks and the Romans and the uh, tribes of the North, the Celts and the Germans took many centuries, actually. I mean, if we look at the history, it took many centuries uh, for these people to be changed. So I wouldn't expect Africa to change overnight, uh, necessarily. Uh, Europe for, didn't change overnight either. But uh, but your points are all well taken, I think. Um, but uh, well, And I would say, I mean, uh, to say that, uh, yeah, and I, I think you're, you're I, would, I would also add that, Keith, your, your overall take is, Definitely solid, and you put it, you know, better than I I could have put it. You know, the the multi-faceted uh, way that a culture is is defined through history and the many elements that make up for it. But as far as uh, Christianity not affecting the the culture of other places in the world, I mean, I I don't know. Like, if you look at some African tribe and say, well, they're still they're still living in mud huts and they're still uh, you know, wearing loincloths and and they're they're still chanting and and they still look the same. I mean, maybe that's true, but I would say, you know, I I, I would strongly suspect that uh, an African tribe that's embraced Christianity is not going to be practicing, for instance, human sacrifice anymore, uh, or uh, various other or doing you know various other things that you find these kinds of cold blood. Blooded barbaric uh, uh, elements uh, that uh, you know uh, you would find in uh, tribes that practice animism, so uh, or uh, or such like. So, I mean, there's Andy. Andy, you have you heard know, of I, 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 you the saying? Lord's Resistance Army, haven't you? Have you heard of the Lord's Resistance uh, Army in Uganda? They're 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 sort of like uh, nominally Christian. But uh, quite um, mm -hmm. savage and barbaric in the, the way they operate. Well, you yeah, can well, also find videos of witch burnings in, in Africa on, on YouTube. 
I've actually shown those to some sure. of my students before. But yeah, I mean, I, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that that African or Asian or whatever civilization has never been impacted by Christianity, even when it's become widespread. I mean, it 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 certainly impacts certain things and on certain some level. But I mean, to say a, a religion can be introduced into a civilization without any impact at all is is, is would be really silly, I think. But um, well, well, here's another example. Like I've actually studied, uh, you know, what some of the I beliefs and practices of some African Christian uh, religions are. And for one, there are some Af forms of African Christianity where you're you're actually expected to practice polygamy. And they say that, well, it's in the Bible, right? It's in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Now, in the West, you don't see anything like that at all. But you do see that polygamy is a well-established uh, tradition in much of Africa. So what they're doing is they're taking the, the Christianity that they're getting that was that's important. Yeah, it's been imported from the West. Christianity has been imported from the West into Africa. And then they're they're reading the Bible and or or whatever they're looking at the you know the teachings of the church fathers or whatever um, and they are giving it their own slant. Um, you know, I, in fact, I heard it said once that well, of course, you know, Christianity would travel well in Africa because that's an Old Testament society anyway, um, or, or culture anyway. Um, so it, it just seems to me that the cultural evolution that we've seen uh, within Christianity in the West has t assumed a different form than what we've seen, say, in Africa or in Asia. Like, I, I've um, also noticed, for example, that, that Asian Christianity tends not to be quite as sectarian. Uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, Western Christians, or at least American Christians, they'll, um, they'll have a, ch a split within a church, say, over you know, what, some sort of doctri doctrinal minutia. But in... Uh, uh, one thing I've I've seen is that in say in China you have people who are Christian and while they're in China they go to the Baptist church or or in Korea or in Japan or in Taiwan they say they go to the Baptist church then they immigrate to the United States and they go to the Catholic church and then they may have you know f American friends or sponsors or whatever that are Baptist and they say what are you going to the Catholic Church for? They say like, well it's all Christian right you know we believe in Jesus right I mean it's um so and and I think that in turn is reflective of what you find in some of the Chinese folk religions you know where you know one village might have its own set of gods and you know the village up the street has its own set of gods but it's all sort of connected in this kind of you know what ancestral tradition or whatever and I think that find that kind of thinking kind of finds its way into into uh, Asian Christianity. Yeah, um, I think maybe we d diverted from the main topic a little bit. Uh, Colin kind of was uh, letting me on about that. But uh, I think the main point that I just wanted to, to get at was that uh, I think we see a, a bit of uh, fedora tipping where they, the, some on the alternative right tend to resort to uh, crude and uh, unsophisticated uh, atheist critiques. Even the pagans will resort to the same kind of critique. But um, maybe to get back more on track a little bit, though, is uh, one of the things that I see, uh, and I, I think this is more universal than just a particular segment of the alternative right, but what I kind of call a, a, maybe a, a, a science fetish. So, so for instance, back to like in the, maybe the early 2000s um, on YouTube, for instance, you might see atheists trolling Christians with evolution. And uh, now you might see uh, the alternative right trolling liberals but evolution, like we're the real Darwinists, or we're the real believers in science, or or you know, X, Y, and Z, or whatever. But uh, and they'll they'll invoke evolution or psychology. That that seems to be a really popular thing to invoke on the alternative right. But um, problem with that is, as I see it, even if true, it's irrelevant because it's the fallacy of genetic fallacy, or as uh, Moore called it, the uh, uh, the materialistic fallacy. Where, because you can describe the origin or cause of a thing, you can then validate or invalidate a thing. And the other, the other problem is the other side can do this too. And not just the old right, but the left as well. One of the things that uh, George Gilder pointed out was that he thought he could use Darwinism to defend pro marriage, pro male masculine values by appealing to, you know, certain ape behavior. But then he realized you have, you know, Desmond Morris's The Naked Ape in the Human Zoo and Robert Andre's African Genesis. 
and then the Imperial Animal, and it's like, oh, wait, oops, uh, they can use that too. And in fact, Jack Donovan actually admits this implicitly in his distinction between the chimpanzee and the bonobo, um, when he talks about that in his uh, On Men, uh, or no, not On Men, but his little book about masculinity, and um, he talks about that as well. So, I mean, you know, if you're a leftist, uh, I think actually in the big picture, Darwinism is on your side. Because if you control the environment long enough, you can have a bunch of passive, effeminate bonobos, which is what they want. And as Jack Donovan pointed out, nature provides with the chimpanzee and the bonobo. So the alt-right and the left can both appeal to nature. It's kind of pointless. It just kind of muddies the water. I think it's a kind of pointless virtue signaling that doesn't really advance the narrative. I think that's um, a bit trite, though, because, uh, uh, yeah, of course, if you if you control the environment for several million years, you produce certain results, and that's what no, that's not what leftists believe. They believe that uh, by moving moving the things around a bit, you can you can change everything in a, in a few generations. I mean, you know, the so, rational the rational direction of evolution is something that both the National Socialists believed and the left, whether it's you know the left key leftist thinkers like H.G. Wells and Bernard Russell were in totally... major, The major distinction, though, uh, even though it is based on differences in time. Oh, but the thing is, though, what, what both on um, the alternative right, the National Socialists, which you might call the first alt-right, um, and the, the first uh, left, people like Russell and Wells, they all agree that through human direction you could speed it up. Uh, and direct it and manipulate it. And if, if that's true, and uh, I mean, if, if, if that is a true thing, then they're both okay, right. They're right. And it's all a matter of just who has the power to direct the outcomes. Well, yeah, the left used to believe in things like eugenics when, when the left was truly progressive. Yeah. But then they've, they've backed away from that and they've just become skills uh, for uh, global corporatism. No, yeah, but what I'm saying is. If this is kind of a it's, it's pointless. It's a genetic fallacy, because even even if they were right, it doesn't prove anything. Just because it has been this way doesn't mean it should be this way. Um, and if you think it should be this way, you need a different argument. And I think it's just kind of a muddying the waters and not helpful. And you see it a lot. You're saying that, you're saying that uh, people shouldn't do eugenics or, you, or um, evolution's a bad thing. What, what exactly are you saying, though? What, what I'm saying is this. Okay, There's what's called the naturalistic fallacy, which was written about, I think, firstly by G.E. Moore. And the genetic fallacy is simply this. By arguing that the state of affairs that we have now should be preserved because we can explain through some genetic process how it occurred, it's therefore good. And that's exactly what the alt right does. It's it's the classic example of the, gen of the genetic fallacy. You're saying the alt right believes that uh, evolution should should stop now with the uh, ultimate perfection of the white race. Is that what you're trying to say there? No, 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 no. What I'm saying is, when they argue for like say feminism's bad because it's against evolution, or equality's bad because it's against well, <laughs> it's only bad in, in in a certain sense. And again, if you control for certain variables. Then you could direct evolution, which is actually the goal of the United Nations, actually, and I think to some extent still is. Then uh, that's uh, not necessarily it, true. Has has goals connected to evolution? That's news to me. Oh yeah, yeah. The founding document, one of the founding documents of the United Nations, uh, UNESCO, its purpose and philosophy, written by uh, Julian Huxley, the brother of Aldous Huxley. He states explicitly the goal of the UN is to scientifically direct the evolution of humanity. Um, and well, that's very much about it, I have to say. In fact, they've been going, uh, you know, full forward in the other direction. Well, well, the other thing is, uh, those same, those very self-same progressives in the 1930s were also for massive population reduction as the same part of the eugenic process, and uh, that's still on course from what they predicted back in the 30s. But, but the fact is, yeah, this yeah. isn't about whether evolution. I mean, a lot of these things are are embedded in 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 the historical circumstances. I mean. Uh, you know, the moves to reduce the population back then, actually, you know, there was a kind of rationale behind that, which was, uh, you know, we weren't so so good at uh, making food appear like we are now. Uh, the Green Revolution hadn't occurred and so on. And so, yeah, there, there were uh, legitimate concerns about overpopulation uh, in those years. And um, 
now it's the, uh, you know, obviously uh, white people have the opposite problem and everybody else uh, still has the original problem. Well, well, well actually that's not true. Uh, demographic collapse is uh, pretty much universal across the world. It's just at different stages. Um, but the, the, the basic point is this, is that it's, it's the naturalistic fallacy. So even if it is true... I don't see Africa's population collapsing very much. Well, not yet. So, but, well, but basically what's happening is... The United Nations I mean, I mean, systematically. By, uh, yeah, by sheer overpopulation, they might well get to that point. Well, what I'm, so what I'm actually you know, the United Nations pursued a strict policy of population control. If you want to get loans from the IMF, uh, according that actually goes back to Kissinger back in the 70s, mm -hmm. you actually have to allow birth control uh, to go into your country, and that's the whole point. Yeah, you, are, and, you are not conflating the IMF and the United Nations, though. They are um, slightly separate, I would Well, they're say. separate institutions, but that's how the deal works. If you want to get IMF loans, you got to allow Planned Parenthood into your country. And, in fact, India under, I think it was Indira Gandhi, yeah, that, practiced and forced... That's, that's the, the same economics they've been, they've been applying to the West, basically. Uh, you know, the IMF, they want to, uh, they want to lower the dependency rate so they want to get more women in the workforce, and so if they're going to if they're going to lend money to a country, they want to get that money uh, back, and they want it to be a successful loan. Therefore, they will um, you know do what they've been doing to the West, i.e., get women to stop having babies and get into the factories, because uh, you know women look after babies is not economics from their point of view. Well, well, no, no, you're right. They do do it in the West. What I'm saying is it's a global plan, and they they've written about this. In, in various literature sources, that this is their global plan. But I think we're, we've veered a little bit off topic. The main point is that a well, lot... What happens when, when you try to conflate the alt-right with the left? I mean, we, we, you know, that, that, that tends to push things a bit off topic. Well, no, what do you mean with the old left? Well, what, no, no, I didn't conflate them. I said they both agreed that, that mankind could direct human evolution and speed up the process. You were well, saying, the well, doesn't, doesn't, doesn't believe in that. The left, I, I well, don't no, know. Well, no, 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 you're right. But back then is what I'm saying. Is, 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 and so what I'm saying, though, the premise corrupt. that I'm saying is, if you want to create the bonobo society the left does through eugenics, you could, but you could also create the society the alt-right wants. And, and that's kind of the point yeah, that I'm making. It goes either way. What well, I can determine, the left is simply retarded. They just, uh, they, they just believe in... Uh, in, in Clark Cuckoo Land, really. Okay, but but, there's, there's but Colin, no I mean, sense you, of reality about what they're advocating and how to go about achieving it. But you do accept the genetic fallacy is a fallacy, right? The naturalistic fallacy. Well, you'd have to uh, kind of like clarify what you mean exactly. Well, okay, I'll read you the actual direct definition of it. The naturalistic fallacy. So. Naturalistic fallacy was, of course, okay, it's uh, G.E. Moore's uh, Principia Ethica. And then Moore argues that it would be fallacious to explain that which is good reductively in terms of natural processes, such as pleasant or desirable. Moore's naturalistic philosophy, fallacies closely relate to the Izzat problem. And what I'm saying is, is when the alternative right, and they, they tend to rely very heavily on evolutionary psychology, to make their points, are in fact actually committing the naturalistic fallacy. And it's it's actually just non-starter. You're not going anywhere. And, and that's, I think, a problem with the alternative right. If they, if they want to demonstrate the problems of feminism and integration and all these things, committing the naturalistic fallacy is not the way to do it. Well, that's such an ill-defined term uh, that I neither agree or nor dis disagree with it. Okay, um, Andy. Andy, what, what do you think about the, this this uh, criticism of their use of the naturalistic fallacy? <laughs> well, I mean, um, I I think I uh, I substantially uh, understand your wh uh, what you're saying, and uh, I you know I I don't know if I would have too much to add to it, but at the same time, it's it's uh, you know, I, I kind of, uh, I take what, what Colin is saying as well, you know, it, it, as, uh, uh, you know, kind of um, uh, a uh, sounding a cautionary note into, uh, you know, not to, again, as, as we say, not to be uh, too, uh, too uh, overly simplistic or, or uh, too 
not understand that there are, uh, um, you know, complications to every to every assertion. But I mean, the 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 uh, as far as your your general uh, uh, your your general understanding of the naturalistic fallacy, I mean, it sounds it sounds reasonable to me, and uh, you know, it sounds like something that. Just like what you were talking about before with the quote unquote fedora tipping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there are good, I think you could make good arguments for, for these particular positions. But, but, I feel, but again, I feel like that, that by, by committing the genetic fallacy, well, it's a fallacy. You haven't proven your point. What's, you're not going to convince anybody with that. And then the genetic fallacy or the naturalistic fallacy is not ill-defined. It's um, it's very well defined. G.E. Moore and others have defined it quite adequately. Um, the problem is <laughs> a lot of people aren't uh, educated in the nature of formal and informal fallacies. And a lot of the alt-right, I think, seems to suffer from that uh, lack of education between the uh, formal and informal fallacies. They'll, they'll often commit both. Uh, and again, I gave a good example of one, the informal fallacy of the... Uh, Naturalistic. Oh, we just lost Andy. Hold on. Let me re-invite him. Uh, so, uh, oh, he's back. He's back. Never mind. He's back. Um, so, yeah, that, that was just uh, one of the points that I was going to uh, bring up about the, the critique of the alt-right. Now, let's see. There was a couple of other points. So much has been brought up. There's other things I want to spring off of, but, you know, it's kind of gotten lost in the conversation. We've been talking over so many issues. Um some of the other things. Um, maybe I'll just uh, turn over to Andy and Colin for a little bit to kind of mull over <laughs> this, and I'll uh, try to remember some of the earlier threads that I wanted to pick up. Well, I was just going to. I, I, I something just, something happened just now. I, I think I got disconnected for a second. But I think there's a, a limit to trolling. I think there's a limit to, uh, and, and and it's part of what alienates me from the the alt right as it is as it ha has come to be constituted, and I I think that. Uh, is this trolling culture taken to uh, to an extreme um, where the whole idea seems to be just to to uh, antagonize? And I mean, I I, I see uh, the I, I see a, a role to be played uh, for uh, you know uh, shock value. And I see that you know there there's value in an antagonizing the enemy in certain cases, uh, and you know there's certainly a value. I mean, what what really drew me to the alt right scene in the first place was my complete disgust and disappointment with the uh, intellectual dishonesty of uh, of the left. Uh, as as the left is constituted today, as you know, the the ascendant left, uh, the the censorious left, and so uh, I I understand the um, I understand the impulse to to hit back, and you know, and I think there's a role to be played for I think satire. You know, using some of the things that the left says today, and I, you know, I'm comfortable speaking of the left as a monolith uh, in this way, just because I, I think I do think that uh, over the past, uh, let's say, ten years, especially, you know, it's hit such critical mass, and to the point where you you can't just assert anything that's outside of uh, the the uh, you know, a certain subset of what's considered acceptable opinion without, you know, losing your livelihood, losing your job, being castigated. Uh, it's it's absolutely obscene the way that things have gotten. But I think that all that said, and I, I don't mean to be so long-winded here, I, I, I'm just trying to say I understand the impulse to... Uh, to antagonize, to troll, I, I, I get it, but there's something to me that just turns me off about this culture now, where the whole idea seems to be, and, 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 they, and, they, and the thing is, 
you know, it, it, trolling can be done tastefully. <laughs> I know that sounds funny to say because you think of trolling as something inherently untasteful, but I'm really not comfortable with you know, like certain things like saying, oh, this guy's a cuck, and then posting a picture of him with his uh, adopted black son uh, and saying, ha, 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 look at him, he's so pathetic. I mean, I, I find that really kind of disgusting. Um, and it, 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 there is a trend towards doing things like that uh, among alt, alt writers today that, that bothers me and, and, you know, frankly turns me off. Well, that's also just kind of silly. I mean, Peter the Great adopted a black man. Well, was he a cuck too? I don't think so. But uh, yeah. well, yes, I, you... I've had a I've had a, a somewhat similar observation of the alt right is what Andy was talking about. And I uh, I was present when the alt right first got started. I remember um, I actually the way I got involved with the alt right was uh, when Richard was uh, Richard Spencer was the editor of Taki's Mag. I, I sent him an article I had written about uh, critiquing the mainstream conservative movement and, and why it's a, basically a big failure, and uh, and he was impressed with that. So I started doing some work for him at Taki's, and then when he started Alternative Right, I was one of the first staff writers there. Um, so I've been involved with the Alternative Right, or at least peripheral to it, since it began, um, and. What I found interesting about the alt-right when it began was the idea of uh, trying to develop um, a, a, an intellectual culture of the right, sort of an independent right that was totally independent of this mainstream conservative movement and all of that and, and opposed to it. And also the idea of importing some ideas from the European right into the North American right, you know, ideas that you get from Marlene de Benoit and, and, and uh, Ernst Junger and Carl Schmidt or Alexander Dugin and Guillaume Fay and all of these people, you know, I thought, well, the, you know, the, the, the American right could benefit from reading some of that, and so could the left, for that matter. So I was interested in, in a, forming a type of right that would pr pursue some of that. Um, what I've seen in the last, say, seven years or so is a, a steady de degeneration of the right, um, and whether that's good or bad, I think, is a, is a you know, subjective value judgment, but uh, you know, what I've seen is the alt-right go from talking about Alexander Dugin or, or uh, Alain de Benoit, Guillaume Fay, to uh, becoming more oriented towards 1920s-style American racialism and eugenicism like Madison Grant and Lawford Stoddard and all of that kind of stuff. And then it's become this kind of thing that Andy talks about, this kind of uh, Howard Stern of the right, uh, you know, all of this vulgar racial and sexual humor. Um, and lastly, in more recent times, the alt-right has more or less become the Donald Trump fan club. You know, so it's like in a mere seven years, it's gone from Alain de Benoit to, to Donald Trump. Now, I, I predicted that would happen. In fact, I wrote an article for uh, alt-right about five years ago that Richard asked me to write. He wanted me to write an article about Alex Jones. And, and um, given that Alex Jones' audience was so big, so uh, what, I, what I wrote in that article was that you know, Alex Jones would be the kind of vehicle that would actually popularize something like the alt-right, but to have an alt-right that had any kind of large audience, you'd have to really dumb it down to, you know, plebeian levels, and, and that's kind of what's happened now with this Donald Trump thing. I mean, you know, Donald Trump is sort of the alt-right for plebes, you know, it's, um, and it's, uh, you know, and maybe that's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not really a, a, a in, totally in that vein politically anyway you know I'm as far as my You're not on the Trump train yet? <laughs> no, well I mean well not just that but I mean in terms of my uh, association with the alt right I'm kind of an outlier you know I'm kind of like the guy that's kind of on the edge of the alt right just kind of looking in in some ways and kind of participating in certain ways but uh, so you know I'm not really a, even a, a right winger in any any conventional sense but uh, the uh, but I have noticed that the alt right has moved from that, or no, you know, in a mere seven years, it's moved from uh, from um, you know, sort of a, a high highbrow intellectualism to sort of a you know, a more of a, a racial determinism of the type that Todd was talking about, to the kind of uh, vulgarianism that Andy's talking about, and finally to Donald Trump. In fact, even if you go to the um, um, Wikipedia page for the alt right, now not that Wikipedia is a credible source of information, but one thing that is interesting is that it says the unifying factor of the alt-right is support for Donald Trump, or, uh, and, uh, and, uh, you know, and, I, and I, you know, I personally think that the enthusiasm for Donald Trump that a lot of alt-right people have is, is misplaced, you know, I mean, I think that at, at best, you know, 
Donald Trump is reading from the standard playbook of the Republican Party that they've used for 45 years. You know, they've, uh, you know, he's doing with, you know, Donald Trump is doing with the alt right with that Nixon, what Nixon did with the hard hats or, you know, with, um, or, or the Wallace supporters or what Reagan did with the religious right. You know, I think the alt right is the, the, the alt right segment that's big, big on Trump is kind of getting taken for a ride, I think, or, or maybe getting their hopes up too high or something like that. But, I don't know that that's all of that is necessarily wrong because if you want the alt right to be a movement, then it has to be something that large numbers of people can relate to in some way. And you know, most people aren't intellectuals. I mean, most Americans are never going to read Alain de Benoit or Alexander Dugin. It's never going to happen. You know, so, uh, so I suppose if if the alt right is to have any kind of influence on society, maybe that's the direction it needs to go in. I, as far as the vulgarians uh, that Andy's talking about. I have mixed feelings about that because another thing that interested me in the alt right when it started, I, you know, I saw it as a way of you know bringing some of this um, um, more in, intellectualized rightist thought into the North America, and as a I saw it as a means as well of sort of subverting the mainstream right, and I also saw it as a potential counterpart to these uh, PC uh, social justice warrior people, and I, I tend to be of the mind that the the more extreme these social justice warrior people become, the more extreme the, their opponents need to become. And while I tend to share some of what Andy is saying, some of the uh, concerns about some of the stuff that you see with the vulgarians on the alt right, I, I kind of look like, well, if, you know, for every social justice warrior, we need the kinds of folks we see in the comments threads on uh, on right stuff dot biz or something like that. You know, even though I don't I don't personally agree with agree with either, any of that, but it's uh, you know, it's, it seems like they sort of balance each other out in a way. Yeah, it's a bit like the way that uh, fascism uh, rose up to oppose uh, the kind of totalitarian and uh, violent tendencies of communism. And so the uh, the kind of trollish aspect of the alt-right has, has risen up to uh, kind of counteract the, um, the, new, the, the, the neurotic behavior of the social justice warriors. Well, so one thing like, I... Yeah, like well, one thing I... And action. Mm-hmm. One thing that I have found with these social justice warrior people is that there's no, obviously there's no reasoning with them. And I think that, and even, even trying to debate them is a waste of time. I really think yeah, ridiculing that, that, them is the they're best they're way to go. Very, very aware of. That's, that's something I, I'd, I'd say the all right is very, very aware of that people are not uh, rational uh, agents. They don't like uh, sit down, listen to the evidence and uh, your logic and then agree with you. They, uh, we, you know, that's something that almost everybody, um, Certainly, the people who are very active on the internet are very, very aware of, and that's that's um, that's the whole that's the whole point behind the tri the triggering. You're actually recognizing how people argue, how it's all emotionally driven, and then you're just like uh, taunting them and triggering them uh, to to make them uh, explode. And you know that's 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 almost become like a kind of online sport for the alt right. Uh, actually. Yeah, Andy and Keith, you, you actually both brought up something that I, I, I would mean to get to and pretty much said everything that I wanted to say. But this this kind of anti-intellectualism that we've seen arising, specifically I think you mentioned that, Keith, uh, in the alternative right. Um, and again, the left is itself is anti-intellectual. Um, and uh, I, I mean, for example, when the, when the left makes an argument, they're never going to use a syllogism. Uh, they don't even know what a syllogism is, and half the time I doubt the alt-right does either. And I, I feel like that, you know, to be a credible intellectual movement, you, you have to have that element of the, the rational core of debaters, the rational core of people that know how to put together an argument, know how to put together evidence, know how to... Because um, basically, if you're not using reason and evidence and logic... Then, then you're just playing a game. We're not even really doing anything worthwhile. It's just a yeah, game. I mean, it almost sounds like you're implying the the alt right doesn't have that. Well, in a lot of, I mean, in in a sense, it used to. I think it did back in 2011 yeah, yeah. and earlier. No, no, the the alt right has both elements. It has uh, very kind of um, erudite, <clears throat> rational people who uh, uh, are a bit long winded and uh, good at uh, you know framing arguments and. Uh, debate in you know philosophies and and then you have the the kind of uh, the shit post and uh, foot soldiers and you know that's the uh, you yeah you have to have that kind of uh, dichotomy in any uh, effective movement. Well, well, I'm not saying that you don't 
you have to have all a bunch of you know Plato brainiacs running the, the in the movement. But I mean, quite frankly, quite frankly, a lot of the intellectualism is surplus to requirements. I mean, um, I mean, why do we have to? Have a, a profound understanding of everything Alexander Dugin's uh, written uh, to be in favour of not being displaced by third world mass immigration. I mean, you don't really need to understand Heidegger to uh, you know stand up your your uh, very very obvious basic interests. Well, well, no, it's not quite that. What what I'm saying is not quite that you have to read all these people. I've just stated a very very rational. Syllogistic position I've just stated there can't really be argued with. No, no. What I'm saying is I'm not saying <laughs> that you have to read. <laughs> no, wait, wait, I'm not saying you have to read all these philosophers and know them inside out. But what I'm saying is, well, if you have an argument, well written. And, and well, no, no, no. Well. What I'm saying is, you if you're going to have an argument with somebody at any level, high or low, to well, have think, the, yeah, if you, to, if you have the argument, you're going to have to use syllogisms. You're going to no, have no, to. You have to you have to determine what's driving them to have their opinion. Is it some sort of psychological thing? Are they emotionally driven? And then if it, if 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 they're um, if they're a kind of um, a logical, fair-minded person, then you can start start to you know unravel the uh, the data and uh, the, uh, the the chains of logic. And if they're kind of um, a knee-jerk, neurotic, kind of emotionally driven asshole, then you just like troll the hell out of them. Well, well, I mean, in one sense, you're right. You don't bother with people that aren't rational. But, but this actually gets to the back to an earlier point of the certain reductionist elements that I see in the alternative right. That um, they'll, they'll give a kind of just so account of of an event that isn't. For example, um, I don't know if you guys saw the Sargon of Akkad and Millennial Woes debate, the most recent one. Um, where it was oh, just yeah. those two guys, it wasn't anybody else. Um, and I think that uh, one of the both sides were reductionist, and I criticize them both for that. But I feel like that in in, in some senses. Uh, uh, I mean, I have I can criticize uh, Sargon, but that's for another time. That millennial lows too often rejected cultural explanations of of, of problems and diversity issues, uh, and then they all just race. Well, no, you have to give an argument why. I mean, sometimes culture... Yeah, been, uh, red pill too hard. I mean, well, sometimes culture does account for these differences, and sometimes it doesn't. And so what I'm saying is it's not only culture, it's not only race. Whereas, you know, yeah. Sargon said it's only culture, Millennial Woe seem to be saying it's only race. We're not debating each other. That's going to sometimes polarize things more than they uh, really should be. I mean, that's the nature of debates. Um, which is one of the drawbacks, really, because uh, you know if you, if you take a more complex uh, position, then it leaves you open to uh, cheap shots by somebody who's not arguing in good faith. And so there might have been a little bit of that. Um, I want to kind of ask uh, Andy real quick, uh, as far as this this sort of anti-intellectualish critique that I've kind of sprung off you and Keith on. What are some of your perspectives? Me? You're asking me? Uh, yeah, yeah, you. Uh, well, um, yeah, I will see. I, I don't know how I would exactly... Um, I'm trying to think of how I would exactly respond to that. Because I don't know if it's the unintellectualism per se, that I object to in, in, in what I was talking about before. It's not... And it's, even, it's not even... Vulgarianism per se, or, or vulgarness, because I, I understand the appeal of vulgarity, and and I vulgarity can be exquisitely clever, uh, cleverly employed, and and uh, it can be interesting and it can be refreshing. Um, to me, there is just, I mean, okay, I think that you, when you're when you're up against lies and dishonesty and deceit and uh, intellectual disingenuousness, the, the best response is truth. And, you know, that's what, I mean, that, that's what I'm in it for. That's, that's, that's why I'm, that's why I write, that's why I, you know, uh, 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 
that's why I'm in the game, so to speak, is because I want I want to promote and promulgate truth, and I see you know, and, and yet there, I guess there's this other uh, way of looking at it, like, well, these people over here are saying all these 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 like social justice warrior types are saying all these you know way out crazy uh, ridiculous things so let's just troll them by you know saying something that we know will make them upset and I, I, I see I mean I'm, I'm trying to be really even-handed here because I see the appeal of that and I you know it appeals to me to just to get in in, in somebody's face and and say something that you know will just drive them crazy. You know, if it's a totally unreasonable person and somebody who wants to control all our lives and wants to make us miserable, you know, that that kind of terrible person that we see, unfortunately, out there so much. The thing is, most I would say that most people who think of themselves as liberal are not this kind of social SJW stereotype. You know, like. Uh, SJW from hell kind of person. Most of them are more reasonable people than that. And, uh, you know, they, they, they buy into a lot of ideas that I think are false or wrong, that we would all disagree with, but they're not, they're not terrible people. They're not bad people in, in and of themselves. And, uh, and I see there's something in if you overplay this hand if you, go, you this 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 trolling type of thing where you're just like well all there all these people on the left are so are just uh, beyond help beyond reason all we can do is just mock them uh, so let's just there, there's absolutely no limits let's just let's just take it to them and you know then then you the, you end up seeing these kinds of things and again the the, the the best example I can, I can think of are things like where, you know, they talk about the the little the little black kid who fell into the gorilla pit and say something like, huh, 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 well, he's the real gorilla," or, or you know, these kind of memes where they, you know, where they, you know, frankly, is insulting to, to, uh, to black people, <laughs> or or this other thing where it's like, oh, look at this this neocon or this this you know. Or whatever, whoever he is, with his adopted black grandson or adopted uh, Ethiopian daughter, uh, uh, huh, 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 we cuck, blah blah blah. I mean, I think the, these kinds of if you know if this is our response, then we're and it's not just a tactical thing, but you, we are alienating people who are you know who maybe are inclined to disagree with us but who are who are also able to listen to reason so there's a tactical reason but uh, not to do not to overplay that hand uh, but also I'd say uh, there's something just wrong in itself it's like you're you're just uh, there, there, you know there's something more it shouldn't just be about picking at scabs and uh, you know making Making this miserable culture even more miserable by by making it even more contentious and and cruel. I mean, there there's got to be a limit to that. There's got to be, and I don't see anyone putting the brakes on, uh, you know, in certain segments of the alt right today. But maybe the more the ones that are getting the more the more notice, the more attention, you know, the kind of sites that. Uh, you know these the, the, the New York Times are writing uh, scolding articles about. Uh, they're they're just you know they're just taking it and and running with it. And a lot of it is 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 funny, and a lot of it is clever. And and you know I, I see the value in some of it, but I really see a danger in the extremes to which it's taken, and just this uh, this kind of mentality like well we don't have to. Uh, we don't have to reason at all. All we have to do is just mock and be insulting and and uh, as cruel as there, there's no uh, there's no depths to which we be as insulting as, as we want, as cruel as we want, because you know uh, everybody that is against us is you know just this obnoxious SJW type. So I mean, I see a, a I see a problem in that mindset.
Yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's probably about time to close out. Um, thanks for joining us tonight, Andy, Colin, and Keith Preston. Um, it's been a really interesting conversation. Um, this is Todd Lewis, host of the Praise of Folly podcast, signing off.